Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, the Memorial Tournament DraftKings picks and preview. Remember, everyone out there, smash the like button, leave your favorite sleeper in the comment section, and if you want a Friday live cut sweat show, there's only one way to get that this week, and it is to rate the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher five stars and leave a review too while you're there say hey i love this show it's great everyone should listen to it that that really goes a long way to help we need 250 new ones of those i checked after monday we're not close so if you do want to tune in i think i don't know if it was the last time we did a cut show sweat live or whatever masters it was and duffner had that gigantic meltdown for me uh that was not great although no it was two years ago at the 2018 masters when i had to go like quit the show for like 20 minutes and go smoke outside because i had just lost so much money but then we got a shot tracker error in our favor the next year and grio did make the cut at the masters and we won the gigantic parlay i might even have to make a specialized parlay to make and miss the cut this week and just to see how it ends up going. I may have to even stack like late wave guys so they're all in contention on the course at the same time for maximum sweat. But if we can get up to 250 new ratings on the audio podcast, Jeff and I will be in studio sweating the cut live with you on the DraftKings YouTube channel and the Pat Mayo Experience Facebook page. Also, subscribe to the podcast. I mean, why wouldn't you do that? Uh, Also, the Pat Mayo Experience Listeners League, where you can always find the link in the description of the video and podcast, is full. Uh, It's now filled on Monday, each of the past four weeks, and just under 7,000 spots is as big as it's getting, so tune in to the Saturday night, Sunday morning show, the first look, if you want first crack to get in on that for next week at the 3M. Also, all the stats provided to you today, if you're watching the video, it's from FantasyNational.com. Use FantasyNational.com slash Mayo, and you get yourself 20% off, or just use promo code Mayo, get yourself 20% off. And I will be doing a live chat Wednesday, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, same video platforms as before. You can catch the audio version after the fact on demand whenever you want my final betting card the weather report ownership and your viewer questions uh, from 12 30 p.m eastern to 2 p.m eastern also at noon eastern on wednesday i'm giving away 20 millimaker tickets on my twitter feed at the pme set your notification now if you're not following probably don't have a good chance of winning i'm just gonna throw out there so you follow at the pme anyway enough of this shit uh let's bring in drew matthews formerly of fantasygolfbag.com now of fade the noise you can check out all of the pga and euro work drew and his team have going on at ftndaily.com plus my good friends at ftn say hey if you use promo code mayo you get a discount so drew that's great news right it is great news yeah use the discount yeah of course i mean it's probably shitty for you but you know for the viewers it's great <laughs> I mean, you could use my discount, but I'm on your show. Use pa- use Pat's discount. <laughs> yeah, discount code Mayo for all the viewers of the Pat Mayo experience. They've been generous enough. And that applies across all sports, too. Uh, so not just golf. It applies to football and basketball and baseball and esports. Your esports guy has been absolutely crushing it lately. So I might have to get in on that. I'm not going to lie to you. But um, I want to congratulate you on the move. Uh, you guys, I mean, you own, you and the team own Fantasy Golf Bag. Now you're a part of this team. I mean, that's... You've come a long way since the first time you were on the show, Drew, and you had just won the Millionaire Maker. <laughs> I know. Imagine going up from there. Um, yeah, it, it's it's been a great move. Obviously, the opportunity with Jeff, Brad, and Kevin um, and all their team to kind of promote what we do with golf on a larger scale because they have a big NFL audience, MLB, NBA. Um, it's a good opportunity for us. That was always just a niche site. Um, it's definitely tough to just focus on golf. So for us, this was a you know, a common sense move to uh, go to a larger site, especially a new site. Um, and it obviously has a lot of opportunity for us as we grow golf into uh, probably a top three sport um, in DFS. Yeah. And I mean, I used everything last week for Euro, got six of six through. And I'm betting Ernest this week, by the way, because I bet him every week, I think. <laughs> He's a stud. I, I, I've been burned by him plenty of times, but I'll, I'll keep going back to Arnos. <laughs> so let's jump into the actual PGA this week. We're back at Muirfield Village for the second consecutive week. The big difference to me this week, besides like the longer rough and the faster greens and the different tee boxes and the better pins or the more tough pins is the field size. So we go from 157 players down to 
at max 133. We'll see who ends up withdrawing and who doesn't. But the past three weeks in the Millionaire Maker and just tournaments overall, less than 3% of lineups have gotten six of six through. Now, if you do top 65 in ties and you prorate that into a field of 157 players, then you're looking at around a 41% minimum amount of players that make the cut. Now that we shrink it to 133, at least 49% of the field will make the cut. Do you expect to see over 10% six of sixes here? Unless, you know, the biggest chalk misses? Honestly, yeah. I mean, the pricing's pretty soft anyway. So I think you could get some really nice lineups that are balanced. And I think a lot of people gravitate that direction. Um, so assuming, you know, I don't think you'll see any crazy chalk, but um, overall, I, I definitely think it's going to be higher. So 10% is probably a good mitt good measure for six of six this week and it's field size like you said but i just think with pricing it's so easy to jam in really good players in that eight and nine k range they're probably going to make the cut and that's going to be a higher six of six range six of six cut um, every week that happens. And that's also one of the main reasons that I haven't been making the two make the cut parlays. I made one last week just for kicks, but like the masters is usually the only time that I actually do that because the pricing actually doesn't change for people to make the cut, despite the fact that there's only like 90 players in the field. So we get a better opportunity this week to sneak guys through, but you just kind of hit on something very interesting that you can build these balanced lineups and essentially roster a team of all-stars across your six spots. And I think that is what a lot of people are going to gravitate towards. That might be the optimal strategy, but I think what we're going to see, where we're going to have almost half the field make the cut this week at Memorial, that stars and scrubs might be a super valuable option. And just with the early ownership that I'm seeing, it's like people like Bryson, they don't like how their lineups look if they use Bryson. Same with JT. Like you could probably put two 10K plus guys into your lineup and just go to the bottom and find guys who could sneak through especially with a higher cut rate, right? Yeah. Like um, it's, well, I was building some lineups last night and definitely even starting with like Cantley, um, when you go to your bottom, like your lowest price guy and you think, oh wow, I can go down to Tiger from Cantley and now all of a sudden I'm in the low 8K range, like your lineup looks better. Um, but I think you're right. If, if you're going to be a little aggressive, especially in the Millie Maker, which you, you probably should, um, you're going to want to jam in some of these guys over 10K take some shots on the 6k range. Um, honestly, you have a higher likelihood of them making it through the cut with the smaller field. Um, but that'll be the different route that people won't take. Um, cause just human nature, you're, you're going to want to, you know, see Paul Casey in your lineup. You're not going to want to see, you know, Max home at 6,800 just visually, it doesn't look the same. So, um, yeah, I, I agree. I think you should take some shots on the 10k guys get a little bit weird, especially in the Millie maker. Cause like you said yesterday or on your Saturday show, I mean, it's a hundred and something thousand people you're, you're playing against. you got to get a little bit weird. You can't just run balanced and, and expect to get too much return on your investment there. Yeah, and I think that more people will go balanced. So we always talk about being contrarian and pivot plays and everything like that. And I think that people blow that out of proportion and be like, well, I can't take this guy. He's too owned. That's not what anyone is saying. That's just apparently what people hear when they talk about yeah. it. Uh, but I think that just amending your strategy a little bit that if the chalk move is going to be building these balanced lineups with let's say 110k 19k and no one lower than like 7500 or something like that or even more balanced than that that i do think that the contrarian value would be to be like you know what i'm taking jt and rory uh they're gonna be like my core and let's go from there for sure yeah I, it's just I think the way it works with these big fields or these big um top heavy gpps you just gotta kind of think what, what is the least comfortable lineup I can build? And it's going to be starting with a JT or a Bryson and then having a, a low or mid 6K guy that you just don't feel as great about. But that's the best risk reward for you in those big tournaments. So yeah, 100% um, guys will go gravitate towards the balance. And in cash, which this isn't a cash show, but in cash single entry, sure. Yeah, build the guy that, build the lineup that you think has the best chance of getting six of six. But man, in the GPPs, especially a week like this, you're just you're asking for it. Go ahead and, and fire up some uh, 10K, 11K guys and then jam in some 6K guys and, and see what you can do on Sunday. Well, let's talk about these 10K guys and see who we like the best. The most expensive player on the board this week. Congratulations to him. He's done it. It's big, bad Bryson DeChambeau, 11,100, the only player above 11,000. Coming off a win, has won at this course before, been basically the best player since the restart, so it makes a lot of sense. JT is number two coming off the playoff loss, 10-9. Rory, we haven't seen since Travelers, he's 10-7. DJ, also haven't seen since Travelers, when he won, is 10-3. And the only other player above, or not even above 10,000, at $10,000, last week's winner, 2L Colin Morikawa. 
22 to 1 to win $10,000 on DraftKings. I am really curious to figure out what happens to Morikawa's ownership because I think that objectively people want to play him, but with Patrick Cantlay cheaper, I think more people will use Cantlay. And then they'll just look at Morikawa and be like, well, I can have a guy who's even $1,000 cheaper, who's basically the same thing, and someone like Hovland that I think that people will say they're going to play Morikawa, but won't end up playing Morikawa. Yeah, I agree. And I think it coming off a win, people just gravitate away from it thinking, oh, it, it happened once. It's probably not going to happen back to back weeks. He's also priced up. So I can take that argument that, you know, at his price, he probably needs a similar finish to last week. Um, but yeah, I agree. I, I don't think he'll be very highly owned at all, especially with the, the guys just above him and below him. Um, I think he'll be the lowest in uh, – I don't know, 9,500 up to, to Bryson. He should be the lowest owned in this group. Yeah, I actually think that Bryson might end up becoming the lowest owned of all these guys, which is just crazy to me. I think I, I didn't use any Bryson at all at Detroit, which you know turned out to be a really horrible move, but that was my stand that, that week. I knew he was going to be the highest price guy. I knew he had the best chance to win, but I was like, if Bryson doesn't win and he just comes, let's say, eighth, and I used a bunch of Hatton that week, that if Hatton wins, like I'm doing great here i ended up losing all my money but uh sometimes those are the uncomfortable chances you have to take they don't always work out when you do it but he's just been so good and if he's not gonna be the overwhelming chalk i don't see a reason not to use bryson here right he won't be overwhelming chalk i think just with the pricing and and honestly the softer pricing in the lower range like we just talked about going going balance um and i think what we've seen a very common trend with millie makers and with millie makers comes the softer pricing um, the ownership gets spread out quite a bit. So I, I, I agree. Bryson will be on the lower side. I still want to throw Colin in there as the lowest in this group. Um, but I hear what you're saying on Bryson. I think it's definitely worth a shot at 11, um, 11, one, obviously playing great. Um, he just had a video the other day. He had 140 mile power club head speed. He's, I mean, like he's hitting a couple of shots and like heaving after, like he's doing workouts, hitting golf balls. Um, it's pretty crazy, but he's been playing great. And, um, I don't see any reason not to think he's going to play well here. He's obviously won here. Uh, I, I like him quite a bit. It's just, I think most people, um, to your point, will shy away from this top tier. They'll go to a Cantley route and saves a thousand, over a thousand bucks. I mean, that, that makes up a lot of difference on the bottom of your lineups. I guess my question about Bryson and his new skill set, he's even been quoted as saying that when he plays these courses that he's played a bunch of times, it's like playing it for the first time because he's hitting approach shots from completely different places based on the new distance that he's added. Do you think that it's going to be somewhat problematic for him, or at least there's going to be an adjustment period where he's played Memorial Muirfield Village really well uh, in his short career. Obviously, he has this was his big breakthrough win was at this course. But even off the tee, like he hasn't been quite as accurate so far since the return, but he's played a bunch of courses where that just really hasn't been a problem. It might end up being a problem here if you end up in this thick rough and then, you know, we haven't really seen him, although he won, hit wedges all that well so far. <laughs> he has it, but I, I think I think to your point, um, the courses will set up a certain way, and he's not just going to hit driver and, and hit it 350 like we saw at Detroit. Um, obviously, the, the two events he came back at, at Charles Schwab and the RBC are drastically different courses than what we saw at Travelers um, and at the Rocket Mortgage he's going to, he's going to adjust for the golf course he's playing. So I think this week where the average drive is around 280 yards, it just doesn't set up for him to pound driver. So I think in these situations, it's not going to be drastically different. He's got to kind of play to the golf course a little bit, if that makes sense. Um, I just think he's got the weapon in the bag on these par fives, but for the majority of this golf course, you can't really rip driver. Um, a lot of guys were laying back off the tee. They just kind of have to with the rough being so penal. Um, so I think, I think at least this week, and you know, as we go forward, we'll see how it plays out on different courses. Um, but he can't attack it like he did at the Rocket Mortgage. He can't just pound driver because the rough's just too penal, I think. Justin Thomas, Rory, and Dustin Johnson are the next three up. Do you have a preference between those three guys? Because it's weird not seeing Rory as the highest price guy. It is. And I, and I, I'll go on record. Um, I was on the anti-Justin train last week, and it didn't work out. I actually... With him right next to Rom, I like Rom a little bit more. Uh, and now we get a huge price difference. So I'll probably end up, you know, long story short, going to Rom down the 9K range. But in this tier, JT is going to be out. And I really, really like DJ here. I think uh, I'm not sure where his ownership will, will kind of check out. Um, but coming off a win at the Travelers, his game looked a little bit better. His birdie rate from 150 to 175 is one of the highest on tour. 
Um, I really like that angle. I don't, I don't hate Rory. I'll have exposure to Rory. Um, but I will go ahead and say, I'll, I'll skip out on JT after last week. Maybe people chase it and think he's going to be more motivated. I'm not sure. And, and for all, you know, all intents and purposes, he might be, I mean, he's one of the best players, if not the best player in the world when he's playing well. Um, but for me, I really like DJ. I think he's somewhat of the forgotten guy. Um, he's been playing awful, letting people down and the travelers was an actual good, finally a good tournament for him comes to this event. Um, and I like his numbers from 150 to 175. I'm going to kind of ride the train at 10, three for him. Well, the weird thing about Dustin that I think that gets overlooked about travelers that he putted so incredibly well that entire week that you always expect him to be huge off the tee. And if his approach is quick, you're like, Oh, he's going to be really good. But he saved himself so many times with so many big putts that he may have played over his head just a little bit. Like he gained, he was bad for him off the tee at travelers and still won, which was kind of crazy, but gained six strokes putting that week. Like I, I think that when it just boils down to it from this top end, the only two that I feel like not necessarily super, I feel super comfortable with them all. They're all great players. But if I was like going to construct my lineup, cause I don't play the 150, I'll probably play like 20 lineups or even 10 lineups in the millionaire maker. that will be Bryson for sure. And then probably Morikawa. Like that's probably just how I'm going to build. I like it. I mean, to, to DJ's point, obviously he didn't drive it well. And this kind of goes into the approach numbers. I mean, he gained six strokes on approach for the week as well. And a lot of that has to do with driving it poorly. You kind of can make it up with approaches. Um, but he also gained, you know, eight strokes um, ball striking at the RBC Heritage. So a different golf course, obviously. But I think DJ is kind of on the upward trend. At least I hope so. Um, and I think people just forget about it. And, and honestly, you gain six strokes putting. You should win a tournament if your ball striking is decent. So I'm not going to knock him for gaining strokes putting, but I get what you're saying. Um, I'll, I'll ride with um, some Rory and DJ. I'll, I'll pin it to those two. Yeah, I, I want to get a better grasp on the Morikawa stuff because even the early projections that I'm seeing in terms of ownership, whether you know I'm going on to fantasynational.com slash mail to get yourself 20% off, that it does seem like a lot of users are gravitating towards him, but sometimes that can get skewed a little bit based on early returns. We're talking on a Tuesday morning. A lot of things can change. I just, I always feel like, if it's not one of the studs that ends up winning the week before and you see that price bump, like we saw it with Burger at Heritage, like no one used Burger at Heritage coming off the win. And then he was just in contention again. <laughs> he was, he, he was, um, I think only nine, nine K or 9,100 or something like that versus the 10 K. So, um, in Millie Baker though, you got to go for it, but a little bit different where I think he still had opportunity at his price that like a top 10 would have paid off and people just avoided the price, the price jump. So, We'll see how it plays out for Morikawa. So the 9K range, I this is where I would expect most of the overwhelming ownership to gravitate. Patrick Cantlay is $9,800. I'm just going to guess he's going to be the highest owned player. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, he won this tournament last year, had the great final round. And when that was actually on TV for people to watch, that's what they were watching was Patrick Cantlay making birdies and eagles out of the gate. 9,800 bucks at 14 to one seems like a really good price. There's not really much you can say that could be a spot where you did want to do an ownership fade, I suppose. But then you have Webb at 96 right below him. Then big Dick Vic Hideki, <laughs> John Rom, Xander Brooks in tiger. I picked tiger to win. Tiger hasn't, since Tiger's return at the beginning of 2018, he's only missed the cut once in a non-major, and that's at Genesis, at Riviera, of course, that he just doesn't play well. So I'm not super concerned about him not getting through to the weekend. Maybe his back flares up or he can't drive the ball and he fucking sucks. You know, then I'm shit out of luck. But as it stands right now, I like Tiger a lot at this price. And as we've seen with Tiger... Over like the history of him being back on the scene on DraftKings, he's not as popular as I think the people perceive him to be historically. I haven't looked at that for his ownership. Usually it's at the Masters or something. He gets the price bump off of course history. But I will say, um, and I, I don't know if, if this is actually good sample size, but if you go back to his whole career at Memorial, he's got five wins here. The course doesn't change much. Um, Tiger hasn't really changed much. He's He's gotten a little bit worse, I guess, through the last couple of years. Um, but a T, T9 last year at this event, um, I'm with you. I like Tiger quite a bit. We just haven't seen him play a lot, but you have to imagine he's prepared. Um, he looked pretty good playing with Brady and them down there. He pretty much, I think he hit every green, uh, had a ton of birdies. So if you can gauge it off of a skins game, I like Tiger quite a bit. 9K for him seems like the the easiest pivot off of anybody in this range that's going to get ownership, like Hideki, Victor, um, John Rom, probably. So 
I'm with you. I like Tiger quite a bit. I think he is one of the safest options to make the cut. And I think he has upside to win this event. Kind of like we saw last year at the Masters where he had such a long layoff. He came back. I think he played the Farmers and then he got ready for the for Augusta and, and won it. So um, I'm with you on Tiger for uh, for this week. Yeah, I'm just not concerned about the layoff with him. He's just been through this so many times and we have enough of a sample yeah. size of him taking. You know, this is a longer, more extended period than we're used to not seeing him. But you know, he can take two months off, come back and just be Tiger Woods. It might take him a few holes to get going, but uh, I'm in on him. We'll see how that ends up turning out. I have. So I'm so rarely in on Tiger. I just like this price. I like this course. And I like the fact that people are pensive about it. They're like, oh, we haven't seen him. Like, that's usually a good time to seize the moment and get lower ownership on a very high-end guy. Like, if he can drive the ball adequately this week, like, he's still a top, what, three iron player in the world? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you don't really have to pound driver here. Like we said at the top of the show, I think 282 is the average. Um, he knows this course as well as anybody. He's one of the best putters in the world on fast greens. Um, and if they're going to be a little bit firmer rolling at 13s, um, his track record here has shown he's he is definitely probably the best option over his career, over anyone's career at Memorial. So um, I'm with you. Well, I'll be playing some Tiger this week. Well, one of the main reasons I really wanted to have you on the show this week, I mean, you're a former former pro golfer. Can we call you that? You were a pro, right? Yeah, you can. Yeah, I was pro. Yes, you we're a pro golfer. So they have played this course in consecutive weeks. And like I mentioned off the top, different tee boxes, different pin locations, faster greens, longer rough because they haven't cut it. Do you think that there's going to be an adjustment period or any sort of disadvantage because to the players who played workday last week in slightly different conditions? Or do they have a more of a massive advantage because it's still the same course? Yeah, I think it's an advantage, if anything. It's definitely not a disadvantage because what happens, too, is those guys, they obviously don't have to travel. So they're seeing the golf course Monday and Tuesday this week or at least feeling the conditions. If it's firming up, they'll see the rust growing up. Um, I don't think, to be honest, I, I was going to tweet this or I said something about it on Saturday. Like Thursday, this golf course looked tough already and, and the rain kind of softened and helped it. Um, but I expect this golf course to play pl to play tough. And I think the people that played last week it's not a disadvantage at all. Okay. Um, I think they're going to see enough through the practice rounds. Um, and the course isn't going to change drastically, but Tuesday, Wednesday, before Thursday, they'll see enough of it to know what the course is going to play like. All right. I just didn't want to galaxy brain myself on that. I thought I'd about run it by someone who's actually played in sort of you know, these conditions who, you know, it's not like me yeah. going out to the course, someone who's actually good, who knows this stuff. Anyway, Webb, when the pricing first came out, I looked at his price and I looked at the pricing and the players around him. And I just assumed no one would own Webb this week, but it turns out that it looks like everyone wants to own Webb. I, I, I get the case for Webb, but I just don't feel like this is a good course for him. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I'm not a big fan of Webb this week. It'll probably be one of my fades in this range. Um, he just doesn't look like he's played this golf course great. And when you look through the numbers... Um, you know, approach and stuff like that has been fine for him, but he does do a lot of damage on the greens, which is negated on these tougher, tougher greens. So um, I'm out on web this week at 9,600. If, if his ownership is high, then I'll feel great about it. Um, I honestly thought it was going to be just one of those lower owned guys that you just kind of exclude and he could burn you, but give me some higher owned web. I'll fade that. Yeah. Like I always like him on shorter courses on Bermuda. Now we have a bit of a longer course, especially if you can't, just mm -hmm. go driver off the tee. Uh, like the approach shots are going to be long and he's good at long approach shots. That's not what I'm saying here, but he can be bad off the tee. Unlike almost everyone else inside the top 20 in pricing. Yeah. He's one of the worst off the tee um, last year and this year he, for the season last year, he was negative off the tee. And then so far this year, he's less than uh, less than 0.1 strokes gained off the tee. So yeah, I, I I'm just not a fan of web this week. I, there's plenty of other good options. And honestly, the, you telling me he's, he might get more ownership um, kind of encourages me even more to fade to fade web here. Yeah, I'm going back to Hovland this week. Uh, maybe you can even speak to this too, is that Morikawa had that meltdown and missed the short putt at Charles Schwab. And I felt like that was really the first time he had been, like he won Barracuda. That's fine. It's like kind of like a warm-up tournament to like the big leagues. He went out and he lost to some real guys trying to chase him down in the stretch, lost in the playoff, gets in this playoff, and, like, his nerves looked better. Victor Hovland, on the other hand, went the other way. I think this was a good learning experience for him, and the guys led T to green the past three weeks. I don't see why he'd go away from him now. Yeah, I like Hovland a lot. I mean, he's he's improving everything. He lost strokes putting the last couple of events and still finishing, you know, top 15, top 10, top 5. Um, his irons look good. His driver looks good. I, I don't see any reason to, uh, to not play Hovland here. He's... Honestly, I know all the hype got around Matthew Wolf, 
But with Victor Hovland, who was his teammate, I mean, he was as good or better at the time. And then Morikawa just didn't win in college, but he's proven he's been more consistent than either of them. So um, I like I like Hovland quite a bit. I'm with you on the um, on how he's been playing around the green. He's actually been improving that, which is a surprise. I mean, he was awful. Um, he even admitted it. So, yeah, I'm with you on Hovland. This is a good golf course, uh, obviously, off of last week for him to kind of carry some momentum. So then you have this little tier of Hideki, Rom, Xander, and Brooks. My instinct says Rom, but I kind of want to play Brooks. <laughs> I mean, he he's he's like the he's not the mini Scheffler, but like the the Friday round kind of entices you a little bit. Like maybe he got it back and and he's going to show us something this week. Um, you just never know with Brooks. He's one of those that you you feel like you're missing out if you don't play him. I, I'll probably avoid him this week, and maybe people just you know maybe he gets six seven percent and I'm not sure if he'll get that high, but. Um, the rest of that range is just so good. I mean, you got Rom Hideki looks great. He looked great last, last week. Um, and then Rom came back and honestly, his ball striking looked pretty good. So I'll go back to Rom, especially at the de- decreased price tag. Yeah. I, I don't know if people are fed up with Rom or not. Just every time that I, I think Feinberg bet him again, I like Rom this week a lot, but I, I think I would just go with a pissed off Brooks is usually a good Brooks. I, I know that's a stupid narrative to play into, but he's cheaper. He's better. Like, why not? Maybe he needs tournaments with Tiger. Is it all the majors that he's won has been with Tiger and the other events he's played? Tiger was there. Maybe he just needs Tiger there that's, for the motivation. That's really interesting. So even looking back, just looking at his two rounds at workday, and obviously he made six birdies in his final 10 holes when he tried to rally for the cut and end up missing it by a stroke. He didn't lose off the tee in any of the two rounds. It was horrible on approach round one and he was horrible through like five holes on approach in round two and ended up gaining almost three with his irons now that would be unsustainable but if he wants to kind of go back to gaining like one 1.5 around and actually start dropping some putts like i think the harder conditions help him more than hurt him it definitely helps him yeah and i i think the the toughest part with a lot of these guys and even as we get into the a carry range it's it's kind of in the same ballpark but certainly for brooks I don't think they're ever that far off of like having a breakout performance. Like I know we look at the stats and we dive in, but it could be like one small thing for a couple of holes. And then if he flips it around on Monday, all of a sudden he's a different player. Um, we kind of saw that with Morikawa off of what the final round of RBC heritage, he missed the cut at the at travelers, I think. And then he comes out here and looks dominant. So um, I don't hate it. I, I just have a tough time getting behind Brooks. Um, I've, you know, eating enough crow in the majors when he's played well. But in these regular events, I feel like people, you know, try to make the case for him and it's not always there. So I'll be uh, I'll be the fish that fades Brooks, I guess, this week. Yeah, I think that just having some low exposure, like my two favorite plays in the 9K are Tiger and then Hovland, one and two. And the rest of the guys might just not use. Like I, if I'm probably going to fade Cantley if he's the highest owned guy and just pray he doesn't play well. He has the longest consecutive streak of made cuts on the PGA tour right now. Eventually that has to end. <laughs> yeah. And it what was, he like close to 30%, I think last week as one of the highest owned or the highest owned guy. So um, yeah, I, I don't hate the fate on Cantley being the highest, owned, especially in big tournaments. But uh, I think the other one, you kind of, you kind of touched on Brooks. Xander's the other guy that I'd never really know when to play him like you just kind of play him when he's going to be lower owned and this looks like a spot where 9200 you know last week he didn't look great but he still finished well I mean, he gained some strokes putting um but xander's kind of like the mini brooks where you never really know which week is a xander week besides obviously the tournament champions he tends to do his most damage in no cut events which is really weird yeah it's a lot like Hideki. This is almost a no cut. Maybe, maybe the 130 man field. He just figures it's a no cut. Yeah, I, like Hideki for me is just such a hard one to get behind. Ninety four hundred dollars with all these guys. I know that, you know, like I think that I've gone too far in the past and saying, like, oh, it's team no putt that kind of thing. But like Hideki can't putt. He's basically Luke List. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's tough. I I think he struggles on certain courses on the greens, but I. I still think I've seen him make enough putts over the last couple of years that I, I don't think he completely sucks. And maybe to, to the Brooks point, maybe just on the verge, it just needs to get some confidence behind it. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I mean, Hovland lost strokes putting in four straight events and he still is finishing in the top five. So um, 
there's an avenue at 9,400 for Hideki to, you know, squeeze into the top five and, and make a winning lineup for you. And he did play well last week. It's just when I look at these other guys, I think that Hovland's striking the ball better than Hideki, if we want to compare those two. Uh, and Hovland's putting has been getting progressively better week by week by week. Yeah, over yeah. Travelers and Rocket Mortgage, he lost almost six strokes putting. Last week, he only lost like a stroke and a half. So maybe he can, like, I just really feel like with the way that he's playing right now with the improved around the green game, that if he can just gain like a stroke, stroke putting not like 10 a stroke that he could win yeah I'm, I'm with you there I don't I don't I don't have a problem with it like I, I think some of these guys we can nitpick a little bit um but they're still some of the best in the world if you're going to play them in a pool of players obviously um I think they're all worth a ch- worth a shot especially in like the millie maker um is assuming they're going to be lower owned. all right 8k guys uh you kind of hit on has a player found something or not found something and i think that there are two very interesting players in this range to go through justin rose is the most expensive of the eight thousand dollar players he is just a hundred dollars cheaper than tiger in at an eighty nine hundred dollars he's followed by ricky Berger, woodland answer reed finau sung jay at 82 fitz Kuchar and Day both at $8,000. Let's start with Rose, who was a disaster last week. No one is using him this week. Like, it feels like a spot where you just blindly close your eyes and click Justin Rose. I think I'm going to play him, to be honest. I'm going to suffer through it. Um, I mean, last week was awful. It was it was so bad. And again, I'll, I'll go through the, uh, the angle that they have two or three days. Or I guess he's got five days to get something squared away. Um, but when we've seen him play at the Memorial in the six starts – um, since 2012, he has one missed cut, and all of them are top 15s. Four of them are top top 10. So, I think Rose has a lot of upside, even how bad he played last week. And it's a little bit of an ownership thing, obviously. If he would have been uh, maybe cheaper, or he just came into a weaker field, being higher owned, it would be a fade. But I think to your point, no one's going to play Justin Rose. They they watched what happened last week. It was not good. Yeah, so there's two guys or potentially three in this range I think that you can go to if you want to construct those balanced lineups that we talked about and get away from some ownership. Rose is obviously one of them. I really like Berger at $8,700. It appears like no one wants to use him again because everyone wants to use Ricky and Gary Woodland uh, at 88 and 84. I'll just go full fade on those guys. And then I'll take Abraham Answer too, who's been – a top three player since the restart at $8,500. Like Finau might double the ownership of answer. Now he is cheap, $200 cheaper. That's fine. But answer has just been better. Yeah. There's a little bit of a stigma around answer a little bit. Burger burgers tough. Cause it, it kind of seems like he, it's not a flash in the pan, but he definitely has gotten hot and he's been playing really, really well. And there's a little bit of hesitation. Like, is this the week where we see some regression? Is this the week we're going to see some regression? Um, I'm with you though on answer answer has been fantastic and he's been putting up really low scores time in and time out since last year. Um, I'm totally fine at 8,500 for him. I do like Gary Woodland a little bit more, but at an ownership advantage answer is probably the play um, to your point, Tony Finau. I like him, but it, I haven't been playing him a lot since the restart, to be honest. And I'm not sure if the ownership this week will get high enough for me to fade him up. As of now, I probably have around 12, 15%. Um, but yeah, I I'm with you. Answer is has been playing great. I probably will avoid Burger though, um, and that could just be me feeling like I, I hit the jackpot a couple weeks in a row with him playing really well, and um, I'm I'm fine with avoiding him here. And it's a lot of it has to do with the people around him. I, I feel like it's really tough. We got Tiger three hundred dollars more. Um, to me, you just look at the names, and maybe it's more of a name thing. But Tiger Woods or Daniel Berger. Who, who would you rather have in your lineup? I would, to I, me, it's just like... I would rather have Tiger, but I don't think this is mutually exclusive. I think you can probably play them both. You could, absolutely. You could definitely play them both. Um, yeah. It seems like a good time to ride the wave with Berger that no one like no one believed him at this price at heritage and he performed really well like no one is believing him at this price either and if we look at some of the crossover places like i do think that the honda classic pga national another nicholas course does over the long term show some decent correlation here obviously firestone is the one that we talk about both in ohio both tough courses where you need to hit fairways but i mean pga national is no different it's just if you miss a fairway at pga national you make like a 10 no, for sure. Yeah, because you're hitting the water. <laughs> yeah, like but, so they're rough and losing a shot. Exactly. I mean, um, unless you're Ryan Palmer, who seems to find the water at both, but you know, we, yeah, he did it here somehow. Made a what, an eight on a par three? I think it was a nine on a par three. Like, he, I think he was fifteen over for the week, and I think he made like. <laughs> 
11, 11 of those strokes over power came between two holes. <laughs> See, and what's funny, though, it's like we were talking about Justin being so bad, Justin Rose being so bad, and I want to go back to it. I wouldn't ever have a desire to go back to Ryan Palmer after that. I, I kind of do. <laughs> really? Yeah, why not? Ryan Palmer, he's a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm he's not, so mental. But he's going to go to that hole and have the same – he's probably going to make 10. Hey, it was like that time that Kevin Na made the 16, and then he came back and birdied it the next year after he cut the tree down with the chainsaw. He did. That, that dude's crazy, too. <laughs> Kevin Na. Well, he's going to be a... Uh, I think he's a super interesting name this week. We'll get to the 7K range soon, though. So, for me... Okay. I like Burger and Answer the best, and I like Im a lot, too. Uh, no one's... Everyone's kind of off the Im train, but he was the player I was specifically speaking to where maybe he just captures something and catapults him. I think, like, talent-wise, he's above all of these guys that are kind of around him. He's still only 22. And the weird thing about him, like he had a really bad round four, but it really masked how good he was with his irons on Friday and Saturday that it was just nice to see him back. Then I went, I actually tweeted this out. If people want to go look like what his recent form was before Honda versus what his recent form is now, it's that he's spiking in everything. It's just, he's not putting one round together or one tournament together. So one day he'll be bad with his irons, but he makes up with that by being good off the tee and good putting a round that he has bad putting. He's hitting his irons really well. Like he's good at all four facets of the strokes gain metrics that we talk about. And whenever he seems to get them all on the same page, rolling at the same time that he's really like high end, but he's good enough at two or three of them in each individual round, even when he's bad, that he still ends up making the cut every single week. Yeah. He, I think he's just been inconsistent. Um, that, that's really been my issue. If you look back at the, since uh, I think the eight rounds, since the final round of the travelers, um, he's gained strokes on approach in two of those um, eight. So I have a tough time getting behind Sung Jay. I think longer term, it looks great. I think he's, he, his form has, proven it's been very good um but yeah i, I i'm actually going to skip out on sung jay this week um yeah I, I think he's just been playing inconsistent and i'm not sure if that's going to turn around for four days um at least this week i think it's a talent based play for me i mean there's no real empirical data like you just mentioned to say oh he's just going to flick the switch this week but I think the thing that separates him as a 22 year old from Morikawa and Hovland, like he's more in the wolf bucket where he's more consistent than wolf is obviously, but like wolf's high end is as high end as those other two guys, except those other two guys just do it every week instead of once every eight weeks. And Sung Jae is somewhere in between, but I do think that his upside is around the same area when he's playing well. And if this course is going to play more difficult, I like Sung Jae at harder courses. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, been the most consistent especially on the made cut obviously um yeah at, at 8200 for me though this week it, it'll probably be a skip but i'm with you like long term too he's up there he's super young um he's shown his consistency over the last three years even the corn fairy tour so i, I don't hate on sung jm but this week i'll probably pass uh reed coocher day fits any interest in those guys um i have some interest in patrick reed been playing him quite a bit this year and He's been sporadic for sure. Last week, well, uh, 39th, but well, I guess, I guess wouldn't, I mean, Reed's obviously a better player, but don't Sung Jay's numbers and Reed's numbers kind of mirror each other in their weird consistency. Now Reed gets it on board more often than Sung Jay does. But like when you go and look at his like round to round numbers, they're kind of all over the place. <laughs> they definitely are. No, I, I, I agree. He just seems to, and I don't know, I don't know why this would be, but it, it seems like with, um, Patrick Reed's short game and his putting, he seems like he gets bailed out of really bad rounds better. Like that stretch he had last fall um, and even in the summer, like even on those bad rounds where his ball striking wasn't there, he saved it around the green. So like in a field like this, in a tournament like this, I, I wouldn't say around the green is a huge deal for me, but I do think that's a, that's a big bonus. If you can scramble and save par um, with these tough, tough pins, tough greens with uh, the high rough, I think that's definitely an advantage and something to consider when you're trying to like maybe one V one or two V two um, some guys in your lineups. I think that around the green, I don't really think we talk about this too often, but I think around the green means more to your cheaper players this week than it does to your expensive players. Cause you just assume your expensive players, like in order for them to return value, they need to hit 
they need to ball strike so well that they need to be giving themselves birdie opportunities to go out and win the tournament. If you have Jim Furyk on your team, you don't really think that he's going to win, but he needs to be able to save his ass if he misses a green to make the cut. For sure. And ironically, Jim Furyk's probably got one of the highest green regulation rates. So he's like, <laughs> somehow he's letting you down, even hitting, you know, 16 of 18 greens around. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I think they're enough in the mid tier though. I do think around the green is enough of a tie break for me to consider uh, at the top range, obviously around the green doesn't mean anything like these guys need to go out and basically play flawless. Um, but in this mid tier, um, I do think that's helped Patrick Reed over the last year to your point of him and Sungjae kind of looking similar. I think that's the difference is just in the short game. I used Jason day last week, probably going to go a pass on Jason day this week, two, two or two tournaments in a row where he can be good. Please. That's a big ask from Jason day upper seven K level. Now we got some names. So when you talked about the balance build, like three of these guys are probably going to be the bottom three players in a lot of people's balance build. You have Casey, Neiman, Leishman, Sergio, Spieth, and Redmond, Streelman, Poulter coming off a good week, Horschel coming off a good week, Kisner coming off a good Detroit, and then Roy Sabatini coming off a really good week. For me here, I'm going back to Neiman. I like Neiman a lot. I don't have a problem with that. Um, I, I'm probably going to go back to Leishman, who let me down last week. He, It's just good course comp and a guy that can go low and burn me last week, go back to him. So I don't hate Neiman. I mean, obviously at the price, there's there's nothing wrong with it. But any any thoughts on Leishman as well as a guy that kind of let everyone down last week? feel like just his driver is not necessarily bad, but it's a lot like why I thought Woodland was going to miss the cut last week, which was looking good for a while. It's just he yeah. sprays it on these weird holes and gets himself into so much trouble. And you can make big numbers at this course that when it was somewhere like Torrey Pines and he hit like four of 18 fairways or four of 14 fairways, whatever it was in the final round, he was missing so badly it was helping him somehow by hitting it like past <laughs> all the trouble onto the trampled ground. He had great lies. Like, that doesn't exist here and we've seen it that since no. and we've seen that since the return he has one or two holes where he just shanks it off the tee and like he, he needs to work that out of his system before i start going back to him i see someone like neiman who did all right on the greens i could use him to do better on the greens but like his ball striking is just so crisp every week yeah, it's, it's funny to your point on leachman really quick i i saw him at uh the arnold palmer a couple years ago whenever he won and it was saturday on 18 and he hit three wood and he blew it so far right over towards 16 T. I mean, it like so far, right. And I was like, man, this guy, <laughs> he sucks. He's, there's no shot. He's going to win anytime soon. And then he comes out and shoots uh, whatever on Sunday and wins the tournament. Um, so like, I, yeah, to your point, that's his game. He, he doesn't know where the driver's going. Even when he hits three wood, it doesn't, he doesn't know where it's going. Um, but I do think his ceiling tournaments are, are winning tournaments. Um, so at his price, I, a little bit of exposure. I mean, he's not going to be popular. I think, everyone in this range is going to have some ownership. Um, so there's really no, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's any chalky spot that you'd have to pivot off of. Um, maybe, maybe a Poulter or Redmond, I guess a Poulter off of last week playing well, but still, I don't think they're going to be like 12 plus percent. Yeah, I think that everyone's just going to kind of be around 10% in this range. Like, everyone's yeah. going to have their favorites, and it's going to be someone different. Like, you can make very compelling cases for Neiman going back to Leishman. I think Leishman might come in with the lower end of the ownership. Um, I'm looking at the numbers on Fantasy National, which says that no one is using Spieth, but I know that people are going to use Spieth because people apparently just use Spieth every single week. Like, people will use... Uh, ben Ann, after his round on Friday in his course history, they feel like he's gathered it back together. And like I mentioned, like Horschel, good iron week, good putting week. I probably wouldn't trust that. I, Redmond could be the guy that no one uses here. I, I can't make heads or tails. He seems outclassed based on the names that are around him, but he's been really good. Yeah, I like Redmond quite a bit. He, I mean, even when he was 8,500 at, at Detroit, um, and he was going to be chalky, but he was like, coming in with that course history and his form coming in, it was so good. Even at 20, 22% owned, it was kind of worth the chalk. Um, I think Redmond's fine. I think Streelman should be one of the higher owned here. And I'm not sure if that'll come out to be the case, but he's been playing well. He plays well at this golf course. Um, he plays well at a lot of these type of courses with POA. Uh, you think about like Pebble beach where, you know, precision off the tee is actually very important. And then putting on the POA, he does a very good job with it. So, um, he kind of had a ceiling performance last week, I could argue, with him gaining strokes pretty much in all facets. 
But I think at his price, he does have top 10 upside, even in this field. Like he's, he's shown that many times. He just doesn't win very much. Um, so I like Streelman a good bit at 7,600. Yeah, I don't think he's going to end up being super popular. I would rather play Kisner over those two guys. I think Poulter's a pretty good fade this week after he gained nine strokes putting. <laughs> yeah, I didn't play Poulter last week, so I was kind of disappointed um, in, in his good performance. So I'll, I'll skip out on him as well. Been on, I haven't been playing much at all. Um, and really my my deal with a guy like Ben on, and, I, and Corey Connors is kind of in the same boat. The courses where, um, or the, the fields where they're kind of priced up with a stronger field, I need them to actually putt. And I, I just can't rely on ball striking and him losing strokes putting, um, you know, and 35th place or, or worse isn't going to do it for me. So I've been out on Ben on anywhere in this price range for him. I've been skipping. Um, but yeah, going down below that, Kisner, I probably, I, pr- I have a tough time going to Kisner here. Same with Horschel. So I really like that top 7K range, and then all of it hop down to the low 7s. Yeah, the two guys that we didn't say, the two Euros, Casey and Sergio, I think that they just prototypically, they're the type of player that you want to back at this course. You're talking about like betting or? Just just in general. Like, like in they're, DFS. They're good okay. off the tee. They're good with their irons. They have good short games. They're not the greatest putters, but we've seen Sergio win on really fast greens before in a very good field, and like he's playing pretty well. <laughs> He is. Yeah. He's playing better. Um, I, I have some interest in Sergio and Paul Casey's the guy that on Monday you're like, wow, Paul Casey at 7,900 um, <laughs> play him Tuesday. No, you can't play Paul Casey. He's going to burn you. And then Wednesday rolls around. It's like, no, you got to play Paul Casey here. He's probably going to make the cut. If you don't play him, he'll end up winning. If you do play him, you're going to get screwed. So um, I'm in on Paul Casey and then Sergio, I do have interest, but it's not going to be a ton of exposure. He's still, I mean, I, I struggled with how well he came from the European tour last year back to the PGA tour and he just struggled. I, I just, I don't get it. Uh, his ball striking stats look so good. Um, and he just didn't translate it over here. So um, you're going to have a little bit of each of them, or do you want to pick one out of those two? Would you say? I think that I, my lean is Sergio over Casey, but I like Neiman the best. So I'll use Neiman and then probably a little bit of Sergio. And then I, I'm going to go with Kisner. He, you know, he's gained strokes off the tee in every event in 2020. I didn't know that. No, I didn't. <laughs> Honestly, it's, I didn't dive too far into Kisner. I just didn't think this would be the best track for him. It's just he's like, I actually think he's played well here, too. I didn't go super deep. Yeah, like he's only missed one cut here in his career going back to he's played it every year since 2014. Only two top 10 finishes, but a 41st, a 74th. Like if he can basically it comes down to his irons, like he's driving the ball so well. And we've seen this type of player win. And like we talk about, like I've talked about the young guns, the ball striking young guns who tend to break through at this course. And we've seen it time in time out, you know, Bryson, we just saw Morikawa, DeChambeau, Hideki at 22 years old, Cantlay, that the other kind of swing is the McGirt, the Duffner who ends up winning. Like Kisner's kind of like a good, McGirt, good version of McGirt and good version of Duffner right now. Like if his irons are working, cause like he gained strokes off the tee, despite being average to below average in distance. Yeah, the, the case that I'll, I'll make against Kevin Kisner is when you look at, um, and I, I wouldn't want to, you know, be nailed down to just 150 to 175 yards. But when you look at the bird year better rate for him, it's one of the lowest in the field, especially in this range um, at sub 5% for this golf course. So I, I think you can make up a lot of that with putting, which he has shown he's gotten hot with the putter. And I, I honestly, if you look at last week's leaderboard, you see a, Ian Poulter, um, you look at Charlie Hoffman, Billy Horschel, those guys kind of got hot with the putter, even though they didn't show they were big birdie makers from that distance. So he can make it up, but that would be my case against them is history. At least this season has shown he, he doesn't make a ton of birdies with those mid irons. We'll say he did. The one weird thing about him from the 150 to 175 is that he might be short of that, that he might be hitting 175 to 200. Cause since the restart, yeah. <laughs> he has played like par fours, 450 to 500, the sixth best of anyone in this field. Yeah. It, it, like I said, I, I think you could look at approach number, you could look at proximity, you could look at birdie or better and stuff like that. And I and I think sometimes with a guy like him, it does boil down to the putter. Same with Billy Horschel. Sometimes it's like, man, his birdie or better rate's huge. It's like, yeah, he gained 13 strokes putting at RBC Heritage and he had every every approach shot was from 145 yards or something. Um, so I'll look more into Kevin Kisner. I will take your advice, Pat, 
and I will consider Kevin Kisner this week. Yeah, I, I think the very logical, if you didn't want to use Kisner, I think Hadwin just kind of rates out almost exactly the same. Uh, he kind of floundered on the weekend, but you know, he he played yeah, pretty he, well. he grades out a lot better for me. Yeah, but I, I don't, he's one of those guys that I worry that like he did it, he did it, he did it, he did it, and then it switched. And we've seen this with Hadwin before, like when he gets hot, he stays hot for a bit, then he gets cold, then he starts getting really cold. So hopefully that hasn't worked because yeah. I like Adam Hadwin a lot. Um, and I'm just kind of dicey upon using him this week. So if we go into the lower sevens, um, I got two guys here for you. Ready for this? Ke- I'm all ears. Keegan Bradley, for obvious reasons. Um, gained almost 11 strokes on approach last week, could not make a putt, which is not shocking. Uh, So just hopefully he can clean that up a little bit. I mean, if he just loses two strokes putting this week, not that I expect him to gain 11 on approach again, but if he can gain like five on approach and just be field neutral in terms of putting, he's going to score a lot. That $7,300, if you look at the top of that board, Phil Mickelson, $7,300. He's playing sneaky well. Yeah, I've been considering him at his price tags. Uh, I'll look at him here. He, I mean, he's actually been toning down the driver quite a bit. You haven't hear him. You haven't heard him talk so much about hitting bombs. Uh, it seems like he's taken a little bit of a different attitude, um, at least since the restart. So I can get behind Phil Mickelson. The guys that I've been looking at um, and kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth as far as looking at ball striking stats, but Harold Varner and Lucas Glover at 7,100 have been like eye-opening as far as how consistent they've been since the restart um, and even this entire year with their off the tee and approach number. So those are two guys that I would look to first, especially if you're hand building, obviously in MME and Millie makers, you can expand outside of that. Um, But man, they've been, they've been very consistent with their approach numbers, been some of the best in the field. So one of the, I mean, Glover's so such a tough nut for me to crack here because I really want to back him because he's been so good since the restart took off last week. Um, but I worry about him and Werner's short game. And this, that is what we get into down here, that they've been so locked in. We saw what happened to Werner last week when he stopped hitting every single green in regulation. He was a disaster. Uh, now he was able to rally a little bit, get closer back to the cut line, because like you said, from 150 to 175, he's been awesome. And same as Glover, when you go and look at it, and even in opportunities gained, he's been so good. But it's sort of like the Joel Damon thing. When one thing goes wrong, everything goes wrong for them. That In that range, like I said, Phil and Keegan, and I'm just going to say, like Brendan Steele is someone I find very interesting. Uh, a guy who couldn't make a putt like Keegan last week and struck the shit out of the ball. But I mentioned him off the top. You know, in the rotation of how Kevin Na works, this should be a peak week for him, right? <laughs> yeah, I've gotten behind Kevin Na more times than I'm, I feel like admitting. Um, well, but but, and, but and honestly, a lot of those include but, but, WDs. Well, hold on. Uh, yeah, some of those include <laughs> WDs. But if you've been a Kevin Na backer over the past year and a half, you've won money. This this started a, a year ago, so I missed half that year. I missed a couple of those wins. Um, no, he he's been he's had a lot of upside. I mean, I I'm all aboard the Kevin Nall train as far as like when he shows up in these events and he's cheap enough, um, throw him in your player pool at some exposure. Cause he's never going to be high owned. He's never going to be over 5% probably um, unless he goes back to an event he won and he's cheap, but yeah, he, he just shows up and he, he plays well. He's almost like a, uh, he's almost like a Poulter light. Like he can, you know, if he drives it well, he's okay. And then if he can get hot with the putter, all of a sudden you're like, wow, he's in the top five on Saturday. No one even thought about Kevin Nall on Tuesday. I, I always like him on these faster greens, and like he's had a good track record at Memorial. I don't know where his back is right now, but he's playing. So you know, he, he was going to play last week, took it off after withdrawing from Detroit uh, with the back injury. Like he, This is almost the exact same situation that we had at, what was it, Travelers, and he played awesome. <laughs> yeah, so he would be... He's almost on that um, the threshold where if you look through his last couple results and his his ball striking stats have looked really good, he's almost on the cusp of let's uh, let's take a break here this week. Let's let's wait to see how it goes because a lot of times when he's coming in re- really bad form, kind of like Snedeker, they all of a sudden show up out of nowhere. Um, so yeah, I, I'll probably have some Kevin Knox exposure. It won't be a ton, but yeah, definitely keep an eye on when Kevin Na and Snedeker, and I'll I'll throw Snedeker in there. When they come into events with terrible form, they sometimes they just pop. Like all of a sudden, they're gaining ten strokes putting and they're hitting a lot of greens, and it just works out that week. So, um, yeah, no, no Kevin Na or not a lot of Kevin Na, but uh, 
I don't know if I can go back to Joel Damon. You kind of mentioned him. That's that was really rough last week. Yeah, and he's not the class of player that Kevin Na is either. Like, it's gonna right. it's gonna be hard for a lot of people to stomach Kevin Na because they use him, he withdrew, and he fucked them. <laughs> and I get that. Uh, he fucked me. I used a ton of Kevin Na in Detroit, uh, even knowing about the back stuff. And we know about the back stuff again. Now you don't need as much Kevin Na, and now he's super cheap at this course. I'm probably gonna end up betting him at like 150 to one because he's the type of player who can just come out and win this. And he's gained on approach, crazily enough, in eight of his past nine starts. And when you look at his putting, it's kind of up and down. But when he gains strokes putting, he tends to gain like five or six strokes putting. Though It's a lot like right. Snedeker in that way that sometimes where, you know, putting can be high, high variance. But it seems like if he starts making putts, he makes a lot of putts and hasn't figured it out. Yeah, they just get hot. I mean, he, he's shown that a lot of times. Um, yeah, I don't have a problem with it. The uh, the Joel Damon thing for sure. I I still view him as like a mini tour player. Like <laughs> he, he was playing so good up through last week. And I was like, all right, maybe he is becoming this class of player. And then he does he does that to us. So um, I'll probably skip on that. We we passed over your boy Corey Connors uh, at seventy four hundred. I will have him again. Um, and that's a little bit of uh, the ball striking just being so consistent. Birdie or better rate from one fifty to one seventy five. Ironically, for a guy that doesn't putt well, um, is up there. So Corey Connors is seventy four hundred in that. Adam Hadwin kind of range. Um, I do like there. Would it shock? And then Scheffler, Scheffler screwed everybody too. I don't, I don't want to talk about Scheffler, but God, I mean, how many weeks in a row can we go back to Scheffler and feel like we're making smart decisions? <laughs> uh, did you know that Bubba Watson until last week had never missed three cuts in a row in his career? I did not know that. No bad run for Bubba right now. He's played well here though. No one's going to use yeah. him again. I, I don't think I'm going to use him either, but uh, I think I'll take my shot on Kevin Na as the guy that no one wants to use that I'll throw into a few lineups. But like, there are some like high upside guys down here. Like even Harris English, who had been playing so well, he almost had like the Daniel Berger momentum before the break. Yeah. Uh, and then everyone went to him at Colonial and he missed the cut. And then no one used him at Heritage. And he played pretty well. Well, I forget, I forget the guy you were just talking about. Um, that it seems like, you know, they have three or four good events in a row. And then all of a sudden you're like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll sit a week out and we'll see how this plays out. Uh, I had this conversation with, with Gudsab from FTN last week on Stallings because Stallings was coming in looking phenomenal. And I was like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to play any Stallings this week. He, he's looked almost too good for three or four weeks and it didn't work out. So um, it, there's some of these guys you kind of time it, I guess. I, I don't want to say you're trying to time golf, but a lot of times guys kind of hit that stride. They play, you know, one or two weeks and they start trending up. We saw that with Harris English for a little bit more, more extended time. Um, but all of a sudden they have a little down, um, a down month or down two months, and then they can start to kind of trend back up. So we'll see what happens with some of these guys, but it'll probably be a sit out. None of them will be too high on where I don't want to say they won't burn you, but, We've seen a lot of times where these guys that are going to be two percent owned, they're not going to be in the Millie Maker lineup just because they're there's the amount of other names you got to get with those lineups um, probably isn't going to work out. So um, I, I don't feel like I'll get burned by a Damon or a Scheffler, so I'll probably wait um, for a different field. We'll say. Oh, uh, I feel like Seb Straka is setting up to be kind of that guy this week. I think that people are going to go yeah. to him. He's been really good, but. As someone who has been a long time Seb Straka backer, that he can go plus 13 real quick. Yeah, I was looking at him too, and I was surprised. Um, I don't know if it was a Vegas line or, or something else, but I was like, well, wow, why, why is Seb Straka up here with these other names? Um, so, yeah, he's, I don't think he's in my player pool right now. To be honest, I had Bubba, which I'm going to reconsider there um, as of last night when I built some lineups. But yeah, Seb Straka was popping up, and I was like, nah, this isn't right. So, <laughs> I'll probably skip out on Seb Straka this week. Yeah, so I, I adjusted my custom model on Fantasy National from the Saturday show, just updated it a little bit, uh, and I have sorted it by all of the rounds since the restart. Uh, so obviously Tiger just has a big black streak through his name because uh, he has not played mm -hmm. yet. But Seb Straka rates out 20th. Uh, Harold Varner rates out 19th. That shouldn't be a shock. And then when we go into the 6K range, other guys who rate out well by the numbers that I really don't want to use are all back-to-back-to-back. To back to back. It's... Kokrak rates out really well. So does Nick Taylor, and so does Max Homa. <laughs> yeah, Max Homa, I'll probably go back to. Um, isn't he bad? It, but isn't he bad chalk, though? Only because everyone likes using him because everyone likes him? 
I mean, off two missed cuts, though, I don't know how chalky he'll be. And again, at, down in this price range, I never really feel like people are going to hammer one guy. I feel like maybe that was the time last week, but I, I could be mistaken. I, I just don't feel like he's going to be so high owned that it's worth the the chalk pivot, I guess. Yeah, it's just I don't see a huge discrepancy between a lot of these guys in like 7,200 to 6,700 and then below 6,700. I think that you can find better players just on the whole talent wise below $6,700 than guys in this range. Like, how much is Weisberger? Weisberger is 66. He's the number 29 mm-hmm. ranked player in the world. I get that he hasn't played in ages, but he's still pretty good. Oh, he's worth a shot. Yeah. No, he's definitely worth a shot. I My case for Homa is obviously he's looked pretty good coming in this week. So all, you know, ownership aside, um, when he won at Quail Hollow, like that's a pretty big event to win. Like that's a really tough golf course to hold a lead and win. Um, that was the first win for Rory McIlroy back in 2010 or 11. So that holds a lot of weight for me. When you go to a course like this and he's playing good, um, I'm more interested to play a guy like Max Homa, who I actually, like realistically, I think has top five upside on a tough golf course like this. So that's my case for him. There's plenty of other good names in this range, like Nick Taylor off last week looked great. Um, I'll probably go back to him. And then as you go down, like you did mention Weisberger, I played Grillo last week. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I mean, it, Again, he looked good. And then same with Lanto Griffin um, and Maverick McNeely in that mid that mid range there. So uh, Griffin, I feel like Griffin has turned into a mini nod as far as going up and down. Like I, I can't seem to get two weeks good out of him. It's almost like he shows a little bit of form. You know, if you look at stroke skin approach from last week or the week before, and it's like, all oh, right, he he's trending up or something. And then the next week it's he's back to shit. So um, I have a tough time landing on any particular guy in this range, but I'm with you on Weisberger. He's probably the most interesting coming from the European tour. People, I don't want to say the world golf rankings holds a ton of weight as far as making a guy playable, but he's played so well um, to start the year off and to end last year with two or three wins in like two months. So I like Weisberger quite a bit at 6,600. Yeah. And he's not, like he hasn't played since hiatus in any competitive event. I don't know what the fuck he's been doing, but he won three events last year on the Euro tour. He won Denmark, Italy, and the Scottish open, I think, because he got himself into the British open by doing that. And then like, he's shown up at WGCs. He's played well at the masters before. Like he's played well in majors. It just, he seems weirdly oddly priced down here for a guy who was, he was even eighth in Abu Dhabi earlier this year. And he's Mm -hmm. sort of the prototypical guy you like at this course. Good ball striker, decent around the green camp, but but when he does, he gets off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I like him. I think he's actually a good player and it's tough with some of these guys from overseas and how they come over. We saw with like um, Beauregard for a, a little bit of a stretch of time. Um, I see Matthias Schwab's in here. We saw Eric Van Ruyen, kind of the same thing. Like their stats don't always correlate. And the, obviously the strength of fields are different, but for taking a shot at 6,600, um, you know, take a stab on a guy that's actually shown some really good form for the last year. You don't know where his game's at right now, but it's not, that's really not too important. We know where his game has been. Um, look to, you know, uh, guys around here. There's, there's always warts on these guys. So I'll take the guy that's actually shown some really good upside the last year. I think that there are some logical fades down here. If they get too hot, like Norlander, coming off a week where the ball striking really wasn't there and he did it all with his putter. Uh, that's usually the opposite of what happens to him. So maybe it reverts and he plays well again, but it just seems like he's going to be the guy that people gravitate towards. I would guess that Shez Reevy is going to carry a ton of ownership. Uh, Troy Merritt coming off another good week. Uh, maybe even Bud Colley at a lower price tag are all going to be kind of the names. I like Furyk and Duffner again. I'll go back to Furyk. I'll throw another name out for you is, is Brian Stewart. Uh, I played him last week. Um, he almost mirrored a lot of what I was looking at for Furyk. And um, he lost four strokes putting last week to miss the cut. Um, he doesn't gain strokes off the tee. He's not the longest guy. But like I said, you don't have to bomb it on this course. It's more about approach. And he's one of the better um, proximity guys from that 150 to 175. So Brian Stewart's a name I'll throw out. And then Taylor Gooch as well um, popped last week. So we'll see if that was just a, a flash in the pan. But um, I, I did kind of eye Taylor Gooch the last couple weeks. He just wasn't looking great. Last week showed a little bit of something. I'll uh, I'll find some Taylor Gooch in my lineups. Uh, I'll probably pass on the Gooch, uh, only because I'm just enamored with some other names. Like Munoz almost went full Scheffler. 
last week. He was seven over after the first round, then played incredibly well in the second round, and now he's down to $6,500. I think he's a good enough player that he can turn that around. I'm willing to take a shot on him. Uh, And like these are kind of the guys that we're talking about that if you want to do those superstars, super scrubs lineup that you're probably going to have to populate your bottom end with, like Burned, Furyk, uh, you mentioned Gooch, um, Munoz, Duffner. Uh, and I'm probably going to play Scrivener at $6,000. I know you like Euro stuff, but like TD Green, this guy's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, he is. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any Scrivener right now. Uh, but he's like the, like, out of, I don't, all, I don't hate it. out of all the guys at the min, like, I mean, I know VJ almost made the cut last week, but like VJ, I mean, I guess you could play Stricker. Stricker's been like, all right. Uh, you don't yep. want, you probably don't want to Zang 10 because he might make a 10. I mean, like like Lingmurth and McGirt are higher priced than Scrivener, who's the same price price as the Swedish porn king Carl Peterson, who I didn't even know played golf anymore. Like he's down in this range, like with a bunch of losers, and like he's not bad. <laughs> no, no, he's definitely not bad. He's worth a shot. I mean, if you're wanting a, a min price guy, maybe maybe I'll throw Stricker in there, but that'll be the only other guy. So I, I don't have a problem with Scrivener there. But there's there's just not a ton down here that I love. Like. People I played last week are showing up here, which isn't a great sign. Like Tom Hoagie, <laughs> that's not that's not, that's not a good sign. Um, but I, I've seen people throw out CT Pan. I, I'm not thrilled with that. But overall, sixty, let's say sixty two hundred and down. There's not a ton of, of love for me um, this week. Could you go to Matthias Schwab? Like he's he's a good player. Yeah, I could play him. Yeah, I mean he he came off really well um, in the spring this year, so I have no issue with that. It wouldn't be a lot. Like when we're talking about these low 6k guys it's it's literally darts on a couple lineups so yeah i'm just looking at scrivener right now because <laughs> i'm just talking myself into playing him uh he can be my brandon woo of the week where he just misses the cut and screws a lot of really good lineups but i wouldn't have been able to construct those lineups if i didn't use him because of the price saving so i can't really be can't really beat yourself up about that because you wouldn't have had the lineup to begin with uh he's made four or five cuts in euro uh, his last finish in guitar was t21 like he, but I just look at the way that he ended last year and like real events too. seventh, 55th, 28th, 21st, third, 10th, 13th. Then he withdrew from the Australian PGA championship to end his year. But these, this was like the, you know, the world championship end in the middle East at like the European tour finals. Yeah. Like he's played some good events and done really well in them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Am I making any uh, sort of compelling case here for you? No, I mean, not a compelling case, but I would say, you know, price dependent, he's he's worth a shot. Um, I, I'll, I'll throw out a couple of names for you, though. If you want to move off of Scrivener for a second, I'll, I'll, I got a couple of guys that I'll toss your way because I, I, I would played only, them two weeks ago. I, I would only say Duncan is like the one that really pops yeah. out to me. Yep, Duncan's on my list. Um, I have no problem with that. The other guy that I have an interest in was uh, Brandon Grace. I played him two weeks ago. He his approach numbers don't look great, but on the a couple rounds that he did play, uh, we saw some upside with like very high proximity, like uh, 30% inside of 18 feet for birdie. And he missed the cut uh, at the rocket mortgage, I think, uh, or might've been the travelers. So I might have a shot on him down here. Uh, I even played C with that week, surprisingly, but um, Brandon grace, I don't, I feel like doesn't actually fit down here if he's playing well, which we, it doesn't look like he's been playing great, but uh, I've seen some signs point towards him maybe showing some life. I don't hate it. You, you mentioned CT Pan. The Panimal is like Mr. Approach lately. I don't. I just don't like him at this kind of course. Like, if yeah. we could like rerun Heritage again, like yeah, Pan, let's go. Uh, any short course, I feel like he has a much better chance of winning. <laughs> I'm with you there. Like, what did he make a hole in one last week here? Did he? Was it this week or the? I think. I think he made a hole in one or maybe it was the week before I thought someone made a hole in one. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not a fan of CT pan on this type of golf course. I feel like he actually has to try really hard when it's playing long and, and this isn't even playing crazy long, but you have to hit it fairways, avoid the rough. And all of a sudden I feel like this little guy is going to have tough time out of the rough. He hasn't gained in putting since the WGC St. Jude last year, which has been a full calendar year. And he gained 0.1 that week. Sneaky. Yes, yeah, that doesn't have a lot of upside. Yeah, sneaky bad putter. It's not like it's like reverting anytime soon. Just a lot of red on his card. So let's talk about like a core three before we get you out of here. Uh, top three, like fave plays, any range that you think you'll have the most exposure to this week. You don't need to be held to it, but as you're feeling it right now. Yeah. 
So I, I really do like Tiger. I'm not even a, like a huge Tiger homer. I play him every time he plays, but I do like him with this golf course and I do like him coming off the break um, and at the price. I like him quite a bit. Um, I will throw in Kevin Streelman at 7,600. And then at the top range, I will add, um, I'll add Victor Hovland. 9,500, I feel like is, is perfectly fine. I am going to go Tiger along with you. This is going to turn out so disastrously for us, by the way. Uh, answer <laughs> number two, and then Neiman number three. I think those are my three favorite guys that I'll probably have the highest exposure to this week. But has has anyone ever been pissed at Tiger for missing a cut, though? Well, he doesn't really like, miss. He doesn't miss a lot he of cuts. He doesn't miss a lot of cuts. But, <laughs> but, but for, for one, I don't think people are going to be DMing him on Twitter like they do Max Homa when he misses a cut. Um, they aren't going to be you know bitching at Tiger. That's probably true, but Max engages. That's that's the reason that people like him. That's true. So, so, I mean, what I'm saying, though, is we can, we can you know, suggest Tiger here, and if you miss the cut, no one's going to be mad. They got the opportunity to put Tiger in their lineups. I mean, well, what better gift? The way that I always look at it with Tiger, like I haven't been betting him, I don't use him on DraftKings, is that regardless of what I am up to, I am rooting for Tiger, so I don't actually need to have him. Like, if I take Keegan Bradley this week, like, I need Keegan Bradley to do well. Like, if I don't take Keegan Bradley, (laughs) I don't care if he comes dead last. Like, that doesn't mean anything to me. But even if I don't have Tiger, I still root for him to do well. So it's it's a nice hedge, a nice emotional hedge. It's entertainment. I mean, you kind of want to watch Tiger on TV. Whatever he's doing, you want to watch him. So, I mean, I watched the Skins game with Tom Brady, who shot 113 through 13 holes. So, I mean, and it was because of Tiger. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just the way it is, the facts. So, yeah, I, I'll, I'll be riding some Tiger. If he plays good or bad, still rooting for him. All right, Drew Matthews, now of FTN and FTNDaily.com. Use promo code MAYO. Get yourself a discount over there. Can you let everyone know what is happening at FTN Daily in terms of the golf product right now? Yeah, so myself, um, Skyler of the Golf Gurus, who recently renamed to Skyhook DFS and then Fantasy Jesus, um, we're the three primary PGA content guys for, for daily fantasy. And then Axis also does a betting article. So we have us three and I think two other guys doing projections and some articles. So um, you'll find content from Monday through Wednesday. We have a live stream on Wednesday night. We have a live chat on Tuesday night. Um, and then we have betting um, previews, course previews, and outright bets etc on the bet site so from a daily fantasy to a bets um, we got you covered all right i'm pat mayo you can follow me at the pme on twitter where i'll be giving away 20 millionaire maker tickets wednesday 12 p.m eastern time for two hours so you might want to get in the drawer set a reminder for that to give yourself a shot to get in and let me tell you if you tweet at me after and be like mad that you didn't win you might get put on a list where you're never going to win. Just remember that. There's like 2,000 people who enter and there's 20 tickets. Chances are you're not going to win. So it's still $400 worth of giveaways. Just keep that in mind, by the way. If you want a live Cut Sweat show on Friday with Jeff and I, we need to get 250 new reviews on the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast or ratings. Just scroll down, hit five stars, Stitcher or Apple Podcast, the two places where you can do that. It takes like five seconds, really goes to help the show. And I'd like to do the Cut Sweat Live, but I'm not going to do it if I don't get it because then I'm not a man of my word. Uh, also, go up back and check out the other shows. There's two UFC cards this week. One of those shows is already out, another one coming later in the week. Tons of football going on. What else do I got? Fantasynational.com slash mail gets you 20% off. Stuff up on DKNation.com. There's a lot going on. There's a lot. Even though there's like very few sports, a lot happening on the show. Anyway, I hope someone wins a million bucks this week. That'd be pretty cool. Live chat, 1230 p.m. Eastern time. That was the one I was trying to remember. Be there. I'll release my final card and take your questions. And probably yell at us. It'll be fun. I'm Pat Mayo. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Experience. Experience.